let's talk about how to read a paint label like a pro. Paint labels are confusing. There's a whole bunch of teeny tiny script. It's occasionally in languages we may or may not speak, and it can be a little bit overwhelming. But understanding four basic pieces of information that is usually on almost any kind of quality paint, that will help you make a good decision about whether or not you should bring a new tube of paint back to your studio. Let's begin with the pigment information. The pigment information is found, <laughs> I'd like to say it's found in the same place on every single tube of paint that you could buy, no matter the brand, but that isn't true. I'm gonna focus on this Liquitex bottle though because it is easy for you all to see on my camera. So I'm gonna push these aside for a bit. Pigment information begins with a P and then continues with some letters and some numbers. A couple of things you wanna know. P equals pigment. That's the code for that P. And then all the letters that come afterwards, the W, equals white, so pigment white. The B equals blue, so when you see PB, that's pigment blue. The R equals red, so PR is pigment red. The BR equals pigment brown. This is a confusing one. P, B, oops, that's not a P. <laughs> P, B, K. That equals pigment black. Then you have the Y, which equals yellow. The G, that equals green. And the V, which equals violet. Or in our vernacular, purple. So you'll see a P like you do on this bottle right here. It's a PW6. That means it's transparent white. Excuse me, titanium white. So you'll see things like PW6 or PR102. I'm just making this up. PB. Why do I keep writing that with Bs? PB15 semicolon 3. That's thalo blue. PBK. Let's see. Let's do, I don't know. I think 7. I think 7 is ivory. I can't recall right now. PY 74. PG 7. That's phthalo green. <clears throat> PV 19. I think that's quinacridone violet. So you'll see all kinds of codes like this. And that's your pigment information. And why that, why that is important is it because it lets you know what is making up this paint. So in some cases, like titanium white, Titanium white and PW6, they mean the same thing. This isn't a fancy name. Titanium white is what PW6 is. But then other times you'll find a paint where it says orange. <laughs> well, we all know that orange just isn't a color that exists in nature all by itself. It's, it has to be made up of reds and yellows. So you turn on the back of your label and it will let you know what pigments are in here. And for this orange, it's PY74 and PR112, so a pigment yellow and a pigment red. Understanding that is really helpful so that when you come across a paint that's labeled fresh green, <laughs> this is a gorgeous color. I have so much fun painting with this color. What does fresh green even mean? Well, the fact that I know that it's a PY74 and a PG7, I'm not off the top of my head remembering this, but you could Google what pigment, what color is that, what yellow color is that. You can Google it and figure out what uh, yellow that is, and I know that PG7 is phthalo green. So I have a general idea of what this is going to do for me when I start to paint with it. So that's why knowing your pigment information and knowing that you can look for it and sometimes you do, you have to treasure hunt for it. Like I love Holbein uh, watercolors. They are so lovely to paint with. They are very difficult to read on the label because one, it's a metallic bottle, but two, it's like, where is it? There's lots of info. Oh, wait, there it is. This is a PV19 and that's the information that I'm looking for. Even though this is a Japanese company, they obviously have a lot of things in Japanese and I don't speak Japanese. I know if I just keep looking, just keep patient, I will find my pigment information. So that's number one that you look for. 
Number two, you want to look for your opacity. So opacity, or some people think translucency, depends on if your cup is half full or half empty, I guess. You are looking for, let's bring back that titanium wine bottle. You are looking for a square. And is the square completely filled in? Is the square empty? Now this is not a white square, this is an empty square. Or is your square, let's see if I can find one that's nice and easy to read. Because as we said before, not all the bottles are easy to read. This one's on the side. Is your square half full? So fully colored in black, and it will always be black. That is kind of a universal language in paint. That means it is opaque. You will not be able to see through that paint. An open square or an empty square, or that is a translucent color, you'll be able to see through it, as you can see on this color swatch that they put on the bottle. A partially filled in square is semi-opaque. So you can see that comparatively, these two swatches on the brands, you can see these stripes clearly. This one is only partially available to be seen. So looking for opacity is super easy. It is only a square. However, is it on every single paint bottle? No, and that can be very frustrating. But if you have learned what your pigment information is, that when you're dealing with a titanium white, for example, you know it's opaque, and I'm coming to the cerulean blue hue, turning it over, turning it over again, coming back, taking a second look, let's turn it over again. Oh, there's no square. Well, but I can see here on my pigment information, it's got PB15 semicolon three, PBK11, and titanium white, PW6. Well, I know that this color is probably not going to be transparent because I have a opaque color in this recipe, which is why knowing both your pigment information <clears throat> and your opacity of your pigments is really, really helpful. The third thing you're going to be looking for when you read a paint label is the light fastness. And what light fastness means is how does that pigment, how does that paint, if you put it onto a surface and it gets to see light, sunlight, and sometimes even like certain types of bulbs, meaning light bulbs, how is it going to hold up over time? Will it fade or will it maintain its color integrity? Light fastness, I'd love to say, is as simple as the square or as simple as the pigment information because these are two standard things. If you see a square, you know it's talking about opacity. If you see these informations, every single one of these, if it's talking pigment, it will have the same kind of code. That's not the case with light fastness. Some companies like to use a number system like Golden and Liquitex. So if you see a one, on a golden or liquitex and they're even nicer about it they put a little sun a sunshine symbol around their uh, light fastness rating you know that it's going to do well in sunlight if those numbers get higher and i believe they go to four is their least uh, light fast color uh, code pigment uh, color code is number four that means it's not going to do so well in the light be, that color would not necessarily be good for something you have to plan uh, being in a window or on something you're going to have also occupy outdoor space. So it's probably a color you'd rather use in your sketchbook where it's not going to matter if it sees light. But then there are other companies. They are going to use symbols. And these plus signs on Van Gogh, a watercolor paint that I really enjoy using, the plus signs is when we're talking about light fastness. Or if you are talking about light fastness and Holbein, which I know, there we go. They use the asterisk symbol or a star symbol like this. When your company chooses a symbol over a standard way of talking about light fastness, it's best to go online to wherever their website is, like www.bango.com, www.holbeinart.com, and they will let you know what their system of light fastness rating means so you can make a better decision about your paint. The fourth thing that we need to talk about is one that I find a lot of artists to be quite confused about and people who are new to coming to art being like, what does that mean? And that is the series information. Series information as a general rule, although it is not super clear for every single brand, but of the brands that I have studied and gotten used to using, 
series information lets you know how expensive your paint is going to be. So if something is a series one, like this titanium white, it will be a less expensive paint. That doesn't mean that it is not a quality paint. What that means is to make titanium white, the materials used in this bottle of paint are less expensive and therefore the cost to you will be less expensive. This nickel yellow azo, a gorgeous color from Golden, however, is a series six. It costs considerably more than this monstrous bottle of titanium white to buy this nickel yellow azo, a single pigment paint. It's harder to make, uh, whether the ingredients in this case, I think they're probably earth ingredients, or if you're going to, let me just see if I can find one that's not, okay, so quinacridone colors are typically um, synthetic colors, but they're really difficult to make, and so you'll see this is a series three. This quinacridone red magenta was much cheaper for me to, excuse me, much more expensive for me to bring home than a similar size bottle of uh, titanium white or lamp black or um, another paint that's less expensive. Lots of blacks are less expensive because the, ma the materials used to make them are cheaper. And that's what that means. The difficulty is, while most companies like to use numbers in their series, I do believe, yes, and uh, Windsor Newton likes to use numbers, some companies, <laughs> I love Holbein, but still, why? Why are we not using numbers? They like to use letters, and the letters don't always make sense. So again, go to the website of the art supply that you're looking for, and just double check, they will have a key. I've had to look at the key many times on Holbein, because I'm like, what does the B mean? Is B good? Is B bad? B. So trying to figure that out, you just need to do a little, you need to do a little due diligence and look into your paint. One more thing I wanted to talk about when reading a label that's not part of the four. Remember the four things that I talked about were pigment information, opacity, light fastness, and the series information. I didn't mention to you the name. Why? Because as I said here before, names can be really just marketing. You don't really know what the name means. It doesn't give you any integral information, except in one instance this one up. Oh, I have it over here too. So this is an alizarin crimson hue permanent. And this is a cerulean blue hue. When you see the word hue, that means something. When you see the word permanent, that means something. It doesn't mean that your paint's not high quality. It doesn't mean that this is a bad paint to bring home, but it will let you understand a little bit more about why it may or may not cost the same as a, as a paint that's not, that looks almost identical, cerulean blue or alizarin crimson, but they don't have the word hue in the name. Hue means that it is not a single pigment paint. So like I said before, this cerulean blue is made up of three different pigments, none of which are cerulean blue, to create the color that you may want to use. The same thing with alizarin crimson hue, permanent. It's not made of one pigment. Alizarin crimson is a single pigment paint, but this paint has two pigments in it, PR206 and PR202, both pigment reds. It is also permanent with a light fastness rating of excellent. True alizarin crimson does not. It is a single pigment paint and it is not light fast even though it is a more expensive, higher series paint. Cerulean blue is a higher series paint than cerulean blue hue. So when you see the word hue, it doesn't mean that it's not a good color. It doesn't mean that it's not a good paint. It means it's not a single pigment paint in that color. And if that's important to you, you want to pay attention to that and not just be like, oh, this is cheaper, let's bring it home. It's not going to be the same. It won't paint the same. A true cerulean is not opaque like a cerulean blue hue. It's why when I was buying cobalt, I wanted a cobalt, I love cobalt blue in acrylic, which is a series four paint and very expensive. I wanted to try a cobalt blue, not a cobalt blue hue in watercolor. And I wanted to also try Turner because I really have enjoyed ter using Turner gouache. This was a gift from a friend who went to Japan and brought this home for me. And I decided to spend a couple of dollars more uh, to get the true cobalt versus the 
indicate that this is a single pigment paint PB36 rather than getting the cobalt BQ and spending a little bit less money. So those are some magic words to look for to make sure that you are both understanding your pigment labels, but you are also getting the most out of the information that the companies put on the label. And there are a couple of reasons why you want that or why I think it's important to have it. I mean, first of all, you're saving money sometimes. If you know how to read your paint labels, you won't overbuy the wrong kinds of pigments. You also can save yourself some heartbreak if you understand how to read a paint label because using a paint that's not light fast and then you do all this hard work, especially when you're working in watercolor, and you use all this hard work and you create these pig paintings and they're not with light fast pigments, that painting is not gonna last as long as you would like it to. And you also, I feel like it just knowledge is power. Every time you understand what it is you're bringing home to your art studio, you make better art. You can make better decisions when you're just not like, ah, I need a blue, I need a blue, let's just go here. I'm gonna try this. And this is an acrylic ink. You know, having a little bit of information, taking a little bit of time to understand the labels, even if they're not written in a language that you understand. Oh wait, this one is mostly. Actually, I was assuming because though, because I bought this one in on a US company and this was bought from Japan itself. Anyway, side trip <laughs> on my nerdy art supplies. So anyway, that's how to read. That's the basics of how to read a paint label. It can get a lot more interesting and a lot more nerdy, but we're gonna leave it at that for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have questions that I didn't cover, please leave them in the comments. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.